We're certainly encouraged to have so many missionaries that our church supports and our church has a long-standing tradition of reaching around the world and just thank you to those of you who are uh, members of of the church and who have been supporting and giving to missions throughout the years this is where it goes and we're thrilled to have many of our missionaries with us today would you please stand with us as we worship the lord together
and 14 says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed and how are they to believe in him whom they've never heard and how are they to hear without someone preaching
so much for worshiping with us. You may be seated. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here. It's my privilege to welcome you to Pleasant View. If this is your first or first handful of times here, we hope that you have already been made to feel welcome. We do have two connect tables, one in each lobby, and we would love to formally and officially meet you if you're new to us and hear your story and find out how we might become a part of it. And we do have a gift for you there as well. Well, here at Pleasant View, we don't uh, pass the offering plate, you may have noticed, and, and uh, we do still have bills, and so we just occasionally would like to put out there how you can give to the church if God calls you to that. Um, you can give in person, obviously, we have offering vaults in both lobbies, those wooden boxes, and then we do also have the options to give through the church app, and you can give online, and you can give through text. Um, and so we're grateful for those of you who contribute to the work of the Lord. And as we are in missions conference, it is appropriate to remind you that if you would like to have your gift go to missions, you do need to designate that on your check or in the memo line of the electronic giving. Same thing for the deacon account, the account that we use to bless those in our church who come upon hard times. That is also a specially designated account. So if you would like to give to either missions or deacons, you need to note that on your check. Otherwise, it goes into the general fund to like keep the lights on and things of that nature. So thank you for those of you who contribute. Certainly, if you are a visitor, you are under no obligation. Uh, we, we want Jesus in your heart more than we want your money. Um, but those of you who this is your house and you belong here, we're grateful for your contributions to help the, the work continue to go forward. Uh, speaking of giving, we are in missions conference, as you have noticed, and our special missions giving this year is to support one of our missionaries, Elizabeth Barge, as uh, she has come a upon a sudden need for a new vehicle, and our goal is to raise $3,500 to help her with that, and so uh, that special giving is still going through missions conference, and we're hoping to be able to send her uh, a significant contribution to her new vehicle. We do also want to continue to talk about opportunities to get to know missionaries here, and we have lots of events this week. Uh, tonight, we have an ice cream social, so if you like ice cream, come to church. If you don't, still come to church, um, and uh, we're going to have an opportunity for you to get to know some missionaries here, and there's activities for all ages. And then in the bulletin and in the app, there's so much going on this week. There's a women's event on Friday. There's a men's event on Saturday. There's a uh, get-to-know missionary dinner, lots of nights of the week. Um, Wednesday, the, uh, the Kids Action Club has a special missions focus. Um, Taste of the World next Sunday night. All the details are in the app and in your bulletin. So please show up and get to know the missionaries. Um, and we are grateful to have uh, many of them with us this morning. Uh, and we'd like to release children at this time, age kindergarten through third grade, out the back doors to classes designed specifically for them. So kids, you can make your way out. And uh, we're excited for those who are catching them and sharing the love of the Lord with them. We're, at this time, we're going to have a uh, uh, pastoral prayer. I'd like us to think about what is easier to do what God calls us to do or to do what we want to do. I want you to think about that and in, in the light of uh, Matthew chapter 11, I'm going to start in verse 28, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You know, Jesus says his yoke is easy. I know that in my life, it seems like sometimes it'd be easier to just do what I want to do. But I, I, I think what's hard, it's, it, it's harder to choose to do what God wants us to do. But I believe it's easier. I believe life is much easier if we do what God wants us to do. 
our lessons that, about Hezekiah was, was just, just just showed that you know to me so 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 amazingly. But what is it? What is it that would make the sacrifices that people make? You know, we're here to honor and to learn from our missionaries and to uh, become better at, at sharing, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with, with those we get to know, though, those who come across us in our lives. What is it about Jesus' yoke that is easy? Answer? It's Jesus' yoke, and he's in it with us. That's what makes it easy, because he's going to carry the burden. You and I aren't the ones who will ultimately have to supply the, the, the amazing strength to accomplish it. Jesus is in it with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the amazing grace that you've given, the, the, the amazing thing that Jesus would come to save sinners like us. And Lord, it's an amazing thing that, that uh, he offers us the opportunity to, to be yoked up with him in, in, to accomplish your will and to, uh, to uh, accomplish your, work, your will all over the world, Lord. We, we thank you for the missionaries that are here with us. We, we honor them today, Lord, because they've made hard decisions and they've, they've, they've made that choice knowing that, that you're faithful and you'll, uh, you will be with them as, as they go. Lord, we, we ask that, that you would help us, help us today to recognize that, that living for you and, and being disciples is, is uh, uh, sometimes a hard choice, but it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful life. Lord, we, we pray that, that, that you would meet us in, in, in our needs. We know that uh, we have normal needs every day and and we need you to help us in those. But Lord, we, we pray that, that we might grow this week, that we might grow and be uh, better communicators of, a, of the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, we, we ask you to be with us and to, to, to uh, be honored and glorified. And uh, Lord, we just again pray for our missionaries that, that they'll be encouraged and, and that we'll learn to be more like them. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Well, in just a moment, I'm going to introduce our speaker to you, who's Dave Benzel. Uh, but uh, kind of as I introduce Dave Benzel, I'm going to ask Dave and his wife, Sharon, if they would come up here. And then I'd also like to invite Art and Lisa Blaker to come up here as well. While they're coming, just to save a little bit of time, uh, uh, the Blaker family and the Benzel family have both been serving as uh, missionaries for uh, with us and partnering with us in that regard in uh, Russia and Ukraine. And uh, Art and Lisa have just finished 15 years of faithful service and are retiring from that phase of ministry and life. And Dave and Sharon similarly have just finished 30 years of ministry and are likewise retiring uh, from that phase of their ministry. And we thought it would be appropriate as a church to honor them and recognize their many years of service on our behalf and certainly on the Lord's behalf. And so we just have a, a simple gift for them as a way of saying thank you and recognizing uh, their faithful service on our behalf. So let's, let's give them a round of applause. Well, our speaker for this Sunday is Dave Benzel, and as I mentioned, uh, he has been a professor 
at a uh, seminary in the Ukraine for, has it been all 30 years that you've been over there? More or less, so. Uh, but uh, we're privileged to uh, have his family with us here recently uh, and um, moving forward, that's the plan. So we're uh, privileged to have him here this morning. I'll, I'll turn the rest of the service over to him. It's great to be back here and I mean to be settled in here and feel like okay after this conference um, after the next few weeks we're not leaving you <laughs> and going back to Ukraine that's the strange kind of thing for us because being here this time it, it's just been like a normal home service for us we, we visit and you know we're here we're there but always anticipating that okay we're gonna be leaving and this time we're not so it's um, It'll be, it'll be strange for us, but um, it's also a delight to think, well, well we're just going to be here <laughs> um, with you guys. So um, <clears throat> as when, whenever I'm uh, preaching, I, of course, I'm really thinking about my topic and the, the things we're going to look at, and I just see them in every, everything that we're, you know, every song that we sing and you know, even the pastoral prayer that we just heard and um, uh, Jesus t uh, taking our yoke and whatnot. Um, the song that we sang, I think it was the last one, but um, and now I can't quite remember the words, but um, lead me in your love to those around me. Um, you know, we, we sing it so easily. I, I feel like I'd never heard those words before. <laughs> Although I'm sure I've sang it a hundred times, but it's like, wow, do, do I really want that? Do I really want... God to lead me in love to those around me. And, and I think believers do. Believers do want that. But as soon as we start thinking about that, we start getting a little nervous and, whoa, wait a minute here. And I think even when we talk about, oh, it's missions conference, and there's kind of a twinge like, uh oh, what if, what if God's going to call me? What if God's going to work my, what if God's going to call my kid? Um, I'm not sure if I'm wild about <laughs> this. I mean, yeah, we're supposed to be excited about a missions conference on one hand, but because it's God's work, but on the other hand, um, I don't feel equipped to do it, God. So, you know, uh, send someone else. But um, as we already heard this morning, if you were in, hope you were in the, at the breakfast time and uh, heard Luke, that was a real treat uh, to hear uh, Luke um, um, sharing his heart with us about discipleship and about what it means to follow Jesus. And we're gonna continue that verse, that, that thought of Jesus, um, uh, Matthew um, uh, 4, 19. And we're gonna think about how Jesus changes us because no one no one just comes to the Lord and says, oh, I want, I want to go out and, and preach everywhere. All of us feel the way that you feel. <laughs> All of us are a little nervous about this and whatnot, and we need to be changed. Peter, James, and John, they all needed to be changed. And we're going to think about how, how uh, Jesus changes us. But before we look at the passage we're going to consider, I want to look at one more, uh, one more passage, uh, just briefly, the uh, Matthew uh, 419, and he, Jesus, uh, said to them, uh, Peter and Andrew, if I remember right, and, um, and Luke looked at um, the phrase, follow me, follow me, and I want to consider the rest of it. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, and, and maybe you noticed already the banner up here, I will make you, and that's drawn from that verse. By the way, you see over here, it's also I will. This is Jesus talking on this side. That's what we're look, thinking about this week. Next week, Art's going to be thinking about our response. What will we do? Jesus says, I will do something, and our response is to say, and I will do something. So that's what the, what the I will is. But look at this. Look at what, what um, Jesus says here. He doesn't say... Follow me, and I'm going to, and in, in order to follow me, you have to become fishers of men. And if you're good enough, then I'll let you be one of my disciples. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, 
follow me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really try. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> uh, and if it, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to make you fishers of men. Now, you're, you're tough material, and I don't know if I can or not because you're so bad. But no, he doesn't say that. He knows their hearts. He knows what they're, who they are, what they're like. But he says, I will make you. I will make you fishers of men. And it's not like Jesus picked out the only two people that he could do that for and said it to them. <laughs> no, this is, this is written because this is Jesus' invitation to all of us. When we follow him, the result is we become fishers of men. We become fishers of men. If, and it's, it's not something that just happens instantaneous. It's not like the next day all of a sudden. It's a process. We, we understand that it's a process. But there's, it ought to give you confidence. I mean, yeah, it's scary to think about God using me in the life of someone else. Um, that's, there's, there's something to, for us to worry about. We, we, we feel threatened by that a little bit. But hopefully there's also confidence. Jesus can do it. Jesus said it. I think we can regard this as a promise. I will make you fishers of men. You think of yourselves, Peter and, and Andrew, as, as fishermen, fishers of fishes. <laughs> but I'm going to make you something different. And what we're going to look at this morning, oh, by the way, that, that fishers of men, that, that's just kind of a, a metaphor, okay? I mean, it's not literal, and it doesn't mean that we're all going to be kind of evangelists in the way that Peter ended up becoming an evangelist, preaching to to even thousands of people and whatnot. It's a, it's a metaphor for being effective, skilled at influencing, impacting the hearts of others. It's not just for, it's not just talking about people that evangelize. Yes, there are people that evangelize among us. And all of us want to um, be sharing the gospel with others. Some people do it more effectively and whatnot. But, but any time we are impacting the heart of another towards God, towards the kingdom, whether they're a believer or not yet, we're a fisher of men. I want you to kind of think of that as a broader, as a broader um, metaphor, that fishers of men. We're, we are not fathers, mothers, husbands, wives, insurance salesmen, farmers, teachers, housewives. Those are roles. Again, as Luke was saying, he, he, he mentioned different roles that he has. And we are, what, who are we? What are we? We are children of God that participate in his big plan, his mission. And we have different roles. Parents, um, workers, uh, you know, or different job descriptions and whatnot. Never think of yourself as a, I don't know, a farmer an insurance salesman, uh, even a mother or a father. Those are roles. They're temporary roles. But as a child of God who is privileged to participate in his goal, we are fishers of men. That describes you more than other titles that maybe you've given yourself. Somebody says, who are you? Say, oh, I'm a fisher of men. <laughs> That's what Jesus is making you. And he may use your roles as a parent, as a worker, uh, as a neighbor and whatnot. He uses those roles. Um, but we are, he's making us to be fishers of men. Now, just a few verses later, um, after 419, just a few verses later, at the beginning of chapter 5, Jesus um, preaches what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And we find at the very beginning of this sermon a description of the process, one description of the process. I think there's other descriptions in Scripture, uh, different ways of looking at it, but one description of the process whereby we become fishers of men. And I think it's very profitable for us to look at that, to think about it. This is how it happens. Because we see the early parts of the process maybe, and we think, that's not, that's not the end result. <laughs> well, you look at any factory and you don't see the end result at the beginning, you see it at the end. All the car parts that go into making a car and everything, some of that, you'd never think that was a, a car. When we see the process from beginning to end, it kind of 
helps, oh, that's the big picture. That's what God is doing in my life. And hopefully then we're not going to fight it. Hopefully then we're not going to say, no, I don't want any part of that. We're going to accept it and, and participate in it. It's not a coincidence, by the way, that, that this uh, portion of Scripture um, that we uh, traditionally have called the Beatitudes is found at the beginning of the New Testament. Um, it's very significant. It's very important. It's very profitable for us to think about it um, regularly. Um, by the way, that word, the Beatitudes, that just comes from Latin for blessed. Okay. Um, a few things uh, to think about before we... Um, uh, jump into these. We're going to look at them one at a time, of course, very briefly. Um, I'm, I'm used to teaching for eight hours at a time. <laughs> so um, Mike said I had to finish by four today, so I'm going to have to really cut it short. Um, but uh, no, so we'll have to go, we'll have to go really fast. Um, but um, before, we, before we look at them, um, three things. One, the first is that um, these are not commands. Sometimes we read these and say, oh, I have to try to do this. No, wait, remember, Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men. And these are kind of things that, well, yeah, we're, we're open to them and we accept them and we, we can say we participate in them. There's a lot more we could talk about with all of that. But um, they're not... Don't, don't look at them as commands. Look at them as something that God is producing in us. Okay. When we follow him, again, as Luke talked about this morning, when we are a student of Jesus, these things begin to happen in us. We see them. Um, the second uh, thing is that these are not new. Jesus didn't just make these up. These are all found in the Old Testament. One of them is a direct quote from the Old Testament. Um, others are found indirectly. We see them in the lives of people. We see them in different teachings of the prophets. Um, throughout, throughout the Old Testament, we find them. So these are not new things. Jesus is, is explaining the Old Testament, uh, God's way uh, to us, opening up in, in new language, yes, in, in a new format maybe, but it's... It's truth that's uh, been around for a long time. Third is that these are not, and this is maybe most important, these are not separate categories like, well, I'm kind of maybe more um, merciful, but boy, she is pure in heart. And well, he mourns a lot. <laughs> um, it's, no, understand that this is a process that we all go through. Okay? And I hope to... To help you see that, maybe the most most significant thing uh, today. It's a complete it's a complete process, a cycle. We don't just go through it once; we continually go through it, and each of these things grows and grows in our lives. <clears throat> um, if you just uh, notice, let's look at the next uh, list of all of them real quick. Um, just look at the at verse three: "Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven." And now jump down to 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. See, it's the same. That helps us see that these, these are all one unit. The people that get the, uh, the people in the first category receive the same thing as the people in the, in the last category, we could say. But that's because it's all describing one person. Well, let's um, kind of go through these now, um, one by one. Well, but first, we've got one more, one more word to talk about. You see that each verse here begins with the word blessed. Now, we don't really use the word blessed. Um, I mean, we do use it, but, but uh, we have lots of different meanings for it. And, um, and mainly when we, when we use it, we kind of think of religious words. It's, it's kind of a religious thing, or else maybe almost a swear word. But um, we, don't, we don't use this that way. Uh, it just as normal, normal talking, oh, I hope you have a blessed day. I mean, people would look at you like, <laughs> you know, oh, they go to that church out there. <laughs> um, but see, when Jesus said blessed, it didn't have that, it did have a religious connotation because they knew that 
that a blessed life, blessing came from God. I mean, the Jews knew that. But they used it in the way that we might use the word, you know, lucky, fortunate. Wow, things are really going his way. Um, he's, he's got it all. That's, that's blessed. So when you read this word here, don't think, well, yeah, maybe, maybe being blessed is good, but boy, I'd much rather, you know, be successful in life and have things go my way and all. Understand, understand that everyone in the world who's ever lived, this is their main goal in life, to be blessed, <laughs> to, to have it go well. And, and how we define it, that's how we're different. We define it in different ways. Somebody defines it as, oh, if I have lots of kids. Somebody defines it, no, if I don't have lots of kids. Uh, and, and a thousand other ways. Somebody, oh, if I'm the head of a big company and somebody else says, no, I don't want to be the head of a big company. And, and just all the different ways that we, we define it, lots of different ways. We seek it in lots of different ways, but we all want the same thing. We all want what, what we call a great life. We all want it to, to all go for everything to go our way, to just be really, really lucky, <laughs> fortunate. And you know, when Jesus says, the, he, you know, he's, we don't know how many people were there, but maybe thousands. I mean, we, we read about that in other places where there were thousands of people there uh, listening. And when Jesus said, let me tell you how you can get it all in life. Let me tell you how you can be really lucky, how you can have life to the max. Everybody, you know, pulls out their quill and their ink and their scroll, and they start to write, okay, this is it. I'm, I got to get these bullet points down from Jesus. And then we look at, at the first one. Let's go to the, the next slide so we can see them a little bigger. And, and you guys know these. Uh, I'm sure most of you know these pretty well because these are famous verses. Some of these are very famous, even outside the church. But... When Jesus said, blessed are, and people are writing down, okay, blessed are, and then he says, the poor. And then we look up, what? <laughs> no, no, Jesus, you mean the, the ones who are not poor. <laughs> and no, it's the poor. Now, you know, in, in every language, probably, there's different words that, that we could translate as poor. Uh, we have in English, we have what, beggars, paupers, and impoverished, and you could probably make a big, long list. And in Greek, there's also different words, and there's two common words in the New Testament. One means um, poor. He's so poor that he has to work today in order to eat today. So he's got to, you know, earn his keep for today. That's pretty poor. That's probably poorer than most of us here are today. Um, but there's another word that's even more poor, and it means that you can't even earn enough to, to live today. Maybe you're an invalid. Maybe your, your, your situation, maybe you're, you've got leprosy or some disease and you're excluded from society and you can't earn any. You can only get enough to survive by begging, by, by somebody giving you, um, giving to you. And which word do you think Jesus uses? The one who is so is poor, but he can work today and live today. Or the one who is so poor, he's, he, he can't earn enough. And Jesus uses that second word. Blessed are the ones that can't even help themselves at all. Now, of course, he adds poor in spirit. It's in the spiritual realm. Okay? He's talking about those that are poor before God. And, and I'm sure that his Jewish audience would think, oh, oh that's even worse. <laughs> you know, it's one thing to think, be poor, but at least, well, you know, you're poor here, but you're rich before God. Well, no, these are people that are poor before God. They are bankrupt. Maybe that's the word for us to use today, bankrupt. Bankrupt, but without all the things that we've added, like the, what is it, chapter 11, filing for chapter 11, and all the ways to get out of being bankrupt. You are just bankrupt, and you are stuck in it. There is no getting out of it. You're bankrupt. You owe way, way more than you can ever pay. But 
in the spiritual realm. He's saying these, boy, these are the lucky people. How can that be? How can it be that the ones who are bankrupt before God, that have nothing good to show God, who cannot possibly pay their debts before God, they're the good ones. They're the lucky ones. They're the really fortunate ones. Um, if we had lots of time, if I, if I could go till four, um, we would look at Matthew 18, where Jesus talks, gives a parable of a, of a man that owed a huge debt. It's, it's said to be 10,000 um, talents. And you kind of think, oh, well, 10,000, 10, that's so much. You know, well, a, a talent is 20 years' salary. Okay, so the typical well-to-do even person, person that earns every day, he can expect to make two talents in his lifetime. Maybe a really well-to-do person, you know, maybe he gets three or four talents in his lifetime. But how much was this person in debt? 10,000 talents in debt. I mean, I'm sure when, when Jesus said that, people just laugh. How can you be in debt? 10,000 talents. How, where did you, oh, I had that money around here somewhere. Where did I put it? No, you can't, you can't be in debt that much. <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's 5,000 lifetimes wages. And the guy says, oh, just be patient. I'll pay you back. You know, it only take, well, it's not 5,000 lifetimes. If I don't eat, if I don't clothe, if I don't pay rent. No, it's just ridiculous. But that is our debt before God. That is your debt before God. 10,000 talents, 5,000 lifetimes of salary is how much we owe God. We are bankrupt. We can't, we can't hope to pay, to pay that back. And we could talk a lot about that. Now, of course, every person except for Jesus who has ever lived is bankrupt. So does that mean all people are blessed? Blessed are the bankrupt before God? No, I think Jesus means blessed are those who realize they are bankrupt before God, who feel it, who see it, who believe it. Because then they're going to turn to God and say, as, as the, the um, tax gatherer did in Luke uh, 18, 17, um, where he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Whereas the Pharisee, who didn't think he was bankrupt, he thought, I'm a pretty good guy. God, I thank you I'm not like other men. I thank you that uh, I, I pay my tithe, just as Jason told me to, and I, I go to church, and I fast twice a week. I'm pretty good, and I'm not. I'm certainly not like this tax collector. I'm way better than him. And the tax collector doesn't even look up to heaven. He just, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, he went home saved. Why? Because he was poor in spirit. He recognized that he was bankrupt before God. Again, we could talk a lot about that. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, some people try to... Um, make a distinction between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, just realize that, that Matthew is writing for Jews and they, they didn't like to say kingdom of God. They didn't like to say God uh, lots of times. And so they would say other things instead and they would say heaven. And so they would say kingdom of heaven when they meant kingdom of God. And so don't, don't make a distinction. These are the same, the same things. Um, <clears throat> But what, what is the kingdom of heaven? The, uh, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. It is, it is everything. It's all God designed for humanity. It's, it's all of us and all of um, nature in communion and in perfect harmony with each other and with God. It's, it's paradise. It's when everything works just the way God intended. That's the kingdom of God. Um, in its conclusion. And so it's the, that's why they're blessed. They, they get in, they're saved. They get to be a part of God's ideal universe. We know what the alternative is. Well, maybe you're thinking, okay, well, um, we're all poor in spirit, I can see that, we're all bankrupt, but how do I, 
how do I realize that? How does somebody get to the point where they acknowledge that, where they realize that they're poor in spirit? And again, we could talk a lot about that. And I think that understanding the law really helps, understanding what God's standards are. And, and I hope you understand that the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is designed to help people feel that they're bankrupt before God. The rest of the Sermon on the Mount is your standard is here. God's standard is here. You think, oh, you're not so bad. You're pretty close. No, you are, you're bankrupt. You owe 10,000 talents. And you think you're not so bad because you never killed anybody. If you're angry, you're already guilty. You think you're not so bad because you never committed adultery. Well, if you lusted, you're already guilty. You think you're not so bad, but let's look at your spiritual life. How do you pray? How do you give? Um, let's look at your internal life. Do you worry? Do you judge? What's going on? What are you focused on? What are your goals in life? You're guilty, guilty, guilty. You're bankrupt. And the whole Sermon on the Mount is to help people feel, I am bankrupt, <laughs> so that this process can begin. <clears throat> but I don't think that just hearing the law is enough. Sometimes it, sometimes it is maybe, but it, just when we look in Scripture, when we look at, at Moses, when we look at uh, Isaiah, um, Peter, what do we see? They get a glimpse of God's glory, and all of a sudden they realize their condition. Isaiah sees God's glory, and what does he say? Oh, hallelujah. Well, what does he say? Woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a sinner. Peter sees the miraculous catch of fish, uh, Luke 5, and, and he says, he falls on his knees and says, Jesus, depart from me because I'm a bad fisherman, right? No, I, I'm a sinner. He sees God's glory, a little glimpse of it, and he, he, in the light of God's glory, he sees his, his bankruptcy. And I think when we see that, we also, maybe it's in combination with this understanding of the law and what God expects and whatnot. Maybe there's different ways. Looking in the mirror of the word sometimes isn't enough, but when we see, get a glimpse of God's glory, it's like, Oh, he just shines a flashlight on our, how dirty we are, and we suddenly realize, I am a sinner. Depart from me. We are bankrupt. I am bankrupt before you. Well, as I said, each one of these things uh, deserves a whole sermon, but we have to move on. But let, let me just say one more thing that every day, you, every day I hope you wake up and think, God, I am totally bankrupt apart from you. I can, what did Jesus say? Without me, you can do very, very little. You maybe only reach one or two people today. <laughs> right? No, you can do nothing without me. We are bankrupt. But in him, Paul writes, Colossians 2.10, we are complete in him, we're full in him. Apart from him, we are bankrupt. In him, we are full. That's the two, two truths that we need to hold in balance and remind us each day. We can't just focus on the one. Oh, I'm bankrupt, I'm bankrupt, I'm, I'm totally worthless. We have to remind ourselves, in him we are complete. But don't just start thinking about how complete we are. Remember who we are without him. Hold these two, two in balance. Very short phrases, but very, very significant in our spiritual lives. So... <clears throat> Blessed are the poor in spirit. And then he goes on and says, blessed are those who mourn. When we hear this just by itself, we think, oh boy, yeah, that's me. Man, I just, I, you know, this happened to me and this happened to me and boy, the economy and um, my neighbor said this and kids at school said this. And we think there's all kinds of reasons for me to mourn. There's all kinds of reasons for me to cry. But I don't think that, again, in the context that Jesus is meaning crying mourning because of what others have done to us, but because of what we have done. Um, just this morning I read um, um, Luke 22, I think, where Peter denies Christ three times. And in Luke, he adds a phrase, uh, Luke, Luke says that, um, 
the, the cock crowed, and Jesus turned and looked at Peter. And what went through Peter's heart at that moment? <laughs> and what did he do? He went out and cried bitterly. He wasn't thinking about what others had done to him. He wasn't thinking about the pressure of the guards and stuff. And he, was think, he was seeing his own sinfulness, and he mourned over it. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. We begin to focus more on how our sin has affected other people and God. And maybe you're not used to thinking about how our sin affects God, but remember what David says in Psalm 51. Against you, you only have I sinned sinned. And it's easy to imagine Uriah up there, you know, by God saying, well, what about me, David? <laughs> you know, you took my wife and killed me. <laughs> but David's right. Against you, you only have I sinned. Pre uh, understand, well, I almost started speaking Russian there. Understand that, that <clears throat> our sin is primarily against God. In that parable that uh, we already referred to where the man owes 10,000 talents, somebody owes him money. And it sounds like a lot, 100 denarii. Uh, a denarius is one day's salary, one day's wage. So 100 denarii, it's like three months. It's not just pocket change. It's nothing compared to 5,000 lifetimes, though. And understand, when we sin against each other, that's, that's 100 denarii. It's a few days' salary. It's maybe even a few months' salary. It hurts, yes. But it's not 5,000 talents. Um, how, how can that be? Okay. If I were to go down here and, and um, well, let's say I hit the, hit the pass, slapped him. You know. Well, it would be a little shocking to some of you, okay? But if, if I found a policeman in here and I slapped him, it would be even a little more shocking. Because, I mean, he's a policeman. And um, I remember the days when the mayor of Warsaw used to be sit in this room. And I suppose if you slap the mayor, that's even more significant than slapping a policeman. Or let's say the governor of the state. Or let's say the president. You slap the president. That is already, I mean, you're going to be tackled by, um, you know, big guys in dark glasses. <laughs> and... And if you were to slap the president of another country, and that could even lead to war. That would be an international incident, okay? If I were to slap the pastor, that would not be written about in newspapers all over the world. You know, it wouldn't be reporters talking. Okay? Do you see how the, it, what you do is not the only determinant of how sinful something is? Against whom you do it, can make it more serious. Okay? Maybe you never thought about that before. But when we sin against God, that is just way, way more serious than hurting each other here. And you need to start to, to think that way. And that's what, when we start realizing that, we, that's when we start to mourn. We see ourselves and we, and we, we begin to mourn. Okay? We need to move. Move quickly now. The amazing thing is that he says they will be comforted. And it's not just now, now, everything's going to be okay. He makes everything okay. We'll be comforted because it will be okay. He'll use that pain, the, the problems that we've caused and whatnot. He's going to use that for his glory and maybe for salvation of others and whatnot. When we see our sinful condition, and we mourn over that. The next thing is that we start to view ourselves in a new way. And we see this word meek. And we don't really use that word today. It's kind of negative. It almost sounds like the word weak. You never see commercials that say, you know, you got to drive our car and be meek. Because then you'll really be happy in life. No. They never, never praise that. And back in Jesus' day, the, all the teachers and stuff, they never praised meekness. They looked down on it as something very, very bad. But we know, like Moses, meekest man in all the earth. Yeah, what is Numbers 12, 3. Uh, Jesus is described as meek. Paul is described as meek. 
and meekness is kind of tied in with humility, but there's also an aspect of authority and having advantages. Meekness is not taking advantage of your position, of your opportunities, because you realize you're no better than others. Meekness is letting other people go ahead of you in line. Meekness is not saying, well, wait, I deserve, or I'm going to assert myself. I'm going to try to be first. I mean, again, you watch these commercials, and maybe they have more impact on me because I'm not as used to seeing them because <laughs> uh, we've been gone for so long, and we don't, we don't see those commercials. But um, all these things about, you know, well, if you want to advance in your company, you got to be, you know, assertive and put yourself forward and step, step ahead of the others and stuff. That's not meekness. And if we were to ask people outside of, of the, our community, you know, how do you get ahead in life? They'd all say, well, you've got you to gotta go for it. You've got to grab it. And Jesus says, who gets, who gets it all in the end? The meek. The ones that say, no, you go ahead. I'm not going to grab it. I'm not, I'm not going to do this for myself. I'm not going to take advantages of my either power or strength or opportunities or privileges. I'm not going to do it. And look what they get. They shall inherit the earth. They get it all. They get it all. They don't just get like second best or third best. They will inherit the earth. Again, a lot to think about there. Understand that if we really believe that we're going to inherit the earth, it's a lot easier to say no to things now. If you're going to get it tomorrow, the pressure's off to try to get it today. If you know you're going to get it tomorrow, the pressure's off to get it, uh, to try to get it today. <clears throat> Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. When we realize our sinfulness and see the pain that we cause others, we want to, we want to do right. We want to love others, right? And, and understand, I say love, but the word here is righteous. Righteousness, understand that righteousness is loving lots of people at once. Um, that's all righteous. Righteousness is just showing love to, to everyone and not just a few. We all know that it's not right for a parent to just love a few of their kids. They have to love all of them. And that means that sometimes they have to say no to one to, in order to say yes to another and whatnot. Um, that's righteousness. Righteousness is loving everybody, and that's what we want to do. We want to do that. Um, but what do, we, what do you really hunger and thirst for? What, what do you want more than anything? Do you think that the problems that you face in life are more outside of you? Oh, I want for my neighbor to start mowing his lawn more regularly, or for my kids to start behaving, or my boss to recognize my value. What is it that you want more than anything in life? Jesus says, when you realize your bankruptcy, you want to change. You realize your, your biggest problems in life are you. You're the biggest problem in your life. Yeah, there are other sinners around. <laughs> we live in a cursed world. But you're the biggest problem in your life. And, and you want to change more than anything. You see, you see how God sees you. You see yourself as God sees you, and you want to change. And look what he says. They will be satisfied. He can. He will change you. You will be righteous. You will love everyone the way you long to. You will cause no more pain to people as, as we do as sinners. And understand that it's not like well, oh, these missionaries here, of course, they're way, they're way higher than us. Or Understand that the closer you get to the light, the easier it is to see your sinfulness. The people that are the most closest to God are the most broken, are the most aware of their bankruptcy. Yeah, maybe there is less sin. Maybe they do do a better job of loving and, and whatnot. Maybe, but they see it and feel it way more deeply than the people that are far from the light. Don't expect, boy, I just, 
I wish I could be more mature so I wouldn't have to feel so bad about my sin. <laughs> Understand that repentance and sorrow over sin and whatnot increases as you mature in Christ. The closer you get to Christ, the more strongly you see the differences. But that's part of the process Christ uses to make us fishers of men, to make us models of Christ. Okay, so these first four are kind of negative things. We see problems in our lives, and, and we begin to change as a result. We begin to look at things differently. Now let's quickly look at the next four. And these are a little bit more positive. You start looking more outward and start acting uh, a little bit differently. <clears throat> And this first one, blessed are the merciful, I used to kind of think, you know, why does he say merciful? Why doesn't he say loving? Because in my mind, I always used to think of mercy as being kind of a lower thing. You know, love is up here, agape, and mercy, that's down here. Um, but one day, I realized that, you know what? No, mercy is loving people that hurt you. Understand that forever, in the new earth and in, in, in eternity, it's going to be easy to love each other. It's going to be easy for me to love you and for you to love me because there's not going to be any sin. You will be all delightful, delightful people and, as I will be, and it'll be easy to love each other. No implications there. You know? <laughs> I didn't imply. You may infer, but I didn't imply anything. But... It's going to be easy, but you see right now, under these conditions, life here on the front, which is this world, we're called upon to love people that don't love us back. We're called upon to love people that are not easy to love. We're called upon to love bankrupt people, people that cause pain. And that's what mercy is. And it's a special strategic ministry that we do now. It's... That's really what Jesus means in some sense of bearing our cross. Willing to do what it takes to save other people in spite of what they're doing to us right at the moment. And how can we do that? Well, because we've been, we're bankrupt and we've received mercy. And we start to realize, hey, they're no, wor they're no worse than me. They need what I need. They, they need what I received, and we become more and more willing to give it to them. Pure in heart, blessed are the pure in heart. Pure in heart today kind of, uh, for a lot of people, means, you know, well, they have clean thoughts, or they're very sincere, never had a bad thought. Um, that, understand, that's not exactly what the, what the Hebrews thought about when they, when they heard this phrase. To them, it means you don't have mixed motives. You just have one goal, single-minded. Okay? The boy that's, that's um, going to camp, and there's two girls there he really, really likes, he's in for problems at that camp. He's in for problems this week, right? Because, you know, he's going to sit with her at lunch, and he's going to sit with her at dinner, and there's going to be problems. But if he's just got his eye on one girl, it's going to be a lot easier for him. Okay? That's, that's pure in heart. You have one, one goal. Okay? One thing in mind. Well, what is that thing in mind? He doesn't say here. But look at the result. They will see God. They will see God. I'm afraid that a lot of people come to church, come to Christ, and maybe are saved even, but what they're really seeking is not God, but God's what? God's gifts, what God has to offer. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's helping solve family problems and uh, financial things and whatnot, that God would, would cure the problems in my life. But, and, and maybe that's okay. Maybe God accepts us on that basis. But as we start to, to see ourselves, who we really are, and go through this process, we begin to value God just for who he is. And we don't, we're not thinking about what he can give us. We just want him. We just want to know him. I think that um, the Bible makes it clear that we can't see God 
a human can't see God. Maybe that'll be changed, but it, it kind of, I kind of think that that's not the case. But Jesus said, who, he who has seen me has seen the Father. But Jesus is God. We see God, and we will forever fellowship with Jesus as God. Um, but it seems like we're not going to actually, like, finally, okay, Jesus, thank you, goodbye, and now we're going to focus on the Father. I don't think so. I think we're going to just get um, Jesus forever and have everything that we longed for in him. Again, can't, can't spend time to go on to that, but uh, think about that. Let's move on. Blessed are the peacemakers. And this is the verse that, as I understand it, is, is found throughout the United Nations and other places. Uh, peacemakers, it's a very admired trait. But uh, you all know what the Hebrew word shalom is, that it means a lot more than just, you know, absence of conflict. It's fullness of life. It's when everything is working together and stuff. And I think, I think we're not just to be peacemakers. We're, we're to be shalom makers, shalom bringers. <laughs> we help produce shalom in the lives of others. Yeah, of course it begins with reconciliation with God. And that means we've got to talk about the gospel. We've got to talk about sin and repentance. But when we're, when we're acting this way, we're, we're involved in the family business. You know, it's not just God's plan anymore. It's, it's God and sons. <laughs> it's God and sons, and we're his sons. And we're, doing the, we're involved in the family business, and we begin to look like God, and that's why we're called, they will be called sons of God. Um, a lot of you were at the, the funeral here a few days ago, and... I didn't really know um, Ruth Ann's uh, kids at all, but it didn't take me long to spot every one of them. Just looking around the, the crowd, oh, there, there's another one of her kids, there's another one of his girl, her girls. They look just like their mother. And certain things about them look just like their mother. And when we are helping people reconcile with God and with each other and with life, we are looking like God. We are looking like our Father. And people see he is, he is like his Father. Again, Luke uh, Duggan's talked about how um, a mechanic um, didn't really preach or teach, but just by his life, he impacted the lives of several people. It, he looked like his Father, and they saw that, and it affected them. And they, they got that from him. They caught it. But of course... Moving to the last one, not everybody is glad to hear about sin. <laughs> not everyone is glad to hear about repentance and about turning from worthless things to the real source of life. And so the result is, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. These are people that have so changed from being broken, bankrupt, spiritually bankrupt people focused on themselves to now, they are actually in the midst of persecution, enduring and still loving, still speaking out for God and the truth, in spite of persecution. And, and all of a sudden, without even noticing it, these people have become fishers of men. They start out as, as broken, bankrupt people, and suddenly, they're fishers of men. Now, it as I said, it's not like just a one-time thing. We don't suddenly become all Billy Grahams uh, because we've gone through these different uh, stages. But it's a cycle. It grows and it grows. And again, we're going to have different roles. Not everyone is going to be speaking God's word publicly. But we can all impact others with the truth. <clears throat> So this is how Jesus takes broken, selfish, bankrupt, spiritually bankrupt people, and he makes them, he makes us fishers of men. And this, he is absolutely doing this in your life, if you're a believer, if you're following him. Follow me, and I will do this. And we can, we can see it and rejoice 
or we can see it and kind of be afraid. No, I don't think I want to go in that direction, Jesus, um, because we're still blinded by, uh, by deception. <clears throat> but I hope that you see, I hope you see this process. Um, and I hope, I hope it gives you hope. <laughs> um, I hope you see that, when, why I'm even talking about this at a missions conference. <laughs> because this is the, the destiny for every one of you. Not everyone's going to go. I mean, you've heard that before. But everyone is going to become a fisher of men. And, and it's, not just a, it's, not just, it's not just like, well, a few of you will be drafted, and the rest, sorry, you know, no NFL for you. Um, no, every one of you is going to be called into this. Everyone, God has a place for every one of you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this church, for strong missions emphasis and heritage. I pray that that would uh, continue and that you would be pleased to use um, our efforts to serve you in many ways in this community and uh, beyond. I pray that you would help each one of us to have confidence to um, say yes to your attempts to build us up to be like Jesus. Help us to believe that you can make us fishers of men. Help us not to be afraid to admit that we are bankrupt, that we are uh, spiritually poor before you have nothing to offer, and to trust that you can make us into the kinds of tools, instruments that you would be pleased to use. We want to love others. We want to impact them for good. We want to spread your kingdom. Help us to pay the cost, um, whatever that may be in our lives, uh, to do that. Um, use your word in our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Dave. Uh, we uh, greatly appreciate all of your insights into the Beatitudes and uh, learned some things new there. So that was, that was great. I'm uh, going to dismiss you, but I just want to remind you all to come back out this evening if you can. Join us for some ice cream and fellowship, and uh, also a reminder, if this is your first time here, I encourage you to stop by the uh, connection table uh, so we can get a chance to get to know more about you. You're dismissed. <laughs>